So Kim, thank you very much for agreeing to speak with me. And um, I know it's the middle of the night for you, about um, half past midnight, six o'clock, six thirty in the morning for me here in the UK. Um, so I, I do really appreciate you taking that time. Um, would you mind starting by telling our viewers your short definition of what geographic profiling is? Some people will not have heard of it. It is something you swim and bathe in daily, but for some people it's new. How would you just give them a, a quick explanation of what it is so they, so they really get it? Geographic profiling is a criminal investigative methodology that uses the locations of a connected series of crimes to determine the most probable area where the offender responsible for those crimes is based. So let's say we have a, a serial arsonist or a serial robber or rapist. We analyze the locations where those crimes have occurred and then using a uh, specialized software sys um, system produce maps that show the, the most likely areas to find the offender. So you could think of it as a information management strategy or as a suspect prioritization tool. It helps you find the needle in the haystack. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned software there. Obviously, you've um, you've created your own software, Rigel. Do you feel that geographic profiling can also be used um, analog in an analog way without without software, or do you think you need the software to be able to use it? Well, I think having an awareness of the geography of a crime is valuable for any detective or any police officer. In fact, a lot of experienced ones. Um, think this way and intuitively but there is a lot of research about how offenders operate in space and how they move around and how they hunt and so that's important information to provide mm -hmm. when we run a, a two-week geographic profiling course for detectives or crime analysts the first week is all what you would call the analog stuff it's basically everything you'd want to know about the geography of crime or environmental criminology if you were a, a detective or an analyst and it doesn't involve any sort of software at all it's just stuff that you know you should be probably everyone should be aware of the second week which is a separate course is about geographic profiling about the use of the software um, how to input cases how to analyze them how to generate a report etc so my, my answer is yes there's a lot of value just for getting a, a basic understanding or grasp of offender geography, um, well, geographic profiling is sort of another step after that. What um, what exactly is that course, and whom is it for? Who takes that course? It's um, almost primarily police. Um, so typically, civilian crime analysts or sworn crime analysts, um, police detectives. We've had military people take it from the, for example, the Marines or the Army. Um, and we've had um, intelligence agency people take the course. It's been offered in the United States, Canada, um, England, Sweden, um, and a number of other countries. We've trained military from the Netherlands, from um, um, Australia, Canada, and US, of course, because a lot of the issues facing military people are the same sorts that police officers face, given modern warfare so with improvised explosive devices being set off or, or terrorism attacks in Afghanistan or, or Baghdad. So then that's why that overlap is, is there. But primarily it's um, for people that have some reason to, to apply this stuff in, in their, um, their job environment. You might, you might not know, but do you know how how people use geographic profiling after your course? Do you get any stories from them? Do they discuss any cases with you or any outcomes? So um, I get some, but there's a number of people that do. I do some training, but there's more people that do training um, than than me. So sometimes I'll hear stories from them. Um, sometimes I don't. Um, and I guess I'm, what I'm interested in is I like to know about successes in innovative applications, and I also like to know about um, complications or, or things that, you know, maybe we can improve on from some research. Um, can I give you an example? Yes, please. 
Okay, so this was um, a course run in California. Um, a crime analyst took the course. The idea of geographic profiling is to determine the offender's base. Now, originally we were focusing on where the offender lived, though as we gained experience, we realized the base for the offender's hunt isn't always their home. Um, it might be uh, like one arsonist I worked on, he always went to this bar and drank. When the bar closed, he would set the fires on his way home from, from the bar. So in that example, the bar was the, the base. Now, in the example I want to talk to you about, um, there was a number of um, incidents of vandalism with windows being broken, with bricks being thrown through them. So the analyst thought this was kind of interesting that it was always bricks as opposed to rocks. Um, she ran the profile and it fell on a part of the city that was didn't have any homes in it. Um, but they went out and explored that area and they found a construction site. And in the middle of the construction site was a big pile of bricks that were being used. Mm -hmm. So this allowed them to figure out where the bricks were coming from, from the vandalism. Um, and I don't know if they caught the offender, but they secured the area so the bricks couldn't be picked up, um, probably by a homeless person and, and being used to create um, any more, more damage. So I thought that was a very interesting ap application mm -hmm. and something that was um, outside of, of the, the boundaries of what we had originally thought. And so that's the type of stuff I find really interesting. Because the the locate the origin of the bricks which are being used, they they add another location to the equation, don't they? Because the offender has to get them from somewhere, and he has to carry them around to to be used. And most people would probably not be carrying around a whole lot of bricks when they walk around. So probably, maybe, hopefully, that crimes that or that that building site was not very far from the crime locations if he was just walking around with them. So, that, so that's quite interesting because it's, a, it's not a crime site, it's not a deposition site, it's just an origin site of somewhere yeah. where so, they um, get it from. So I, I, I like it as an example of how we have to be um, open to the idea of what an origin site is for the offender. And um, like I said, I don't know if they, they caught him. I believe they did and I believe he was homeless. But a lot of homeless people have shopping carts, so they put stuff in their shopping carts and they can go some distance. But it just shows you that you have to be, keep your, your, your mind open and consider the specific circumstances of the area where the crimes are happening. Because, you know, central London is not the same as, you know, um, downtown Los Angeles, which is not the same as a, a small farming community. Um, so. You know, you, it's a lot easier nowadays because we have the technology to, to get a really good um, perspective on, on what a particular area looks like. Um, but it still would be my preference for a serious crime to actually go to the locations and look at them and see things. Because you'll see things you won't see on any map or any photograph. And I think even if somebody else is telling you about the location, you just don't know what they may have missed and what you might have noticed if you had gone there yourself. Yes. Yeah. What One of the things I've learned over time was that, that I would go somewhere and I would um, uh, talk to the detectives and I would work on the case and get all the information, visit the sites, and then I would go home. And at that point, we were using a Sun UltraSpark workstation, so it was very, very big piece of, of hardware and then you know maybe a week or two later I would send them the report now um, everything can run from a laptop so I will have my laptop with me I will enter everything when I'm at the crime site then before I go home I'll have run a preliminary profile and I, I find it incredibly valuable to sit down with the detectives to discuss the preliminary profile because they will see things in there that I don't because it's their city or their neighborhood um, and then we can go back and forth and have a very um, productive um, and useful conversation because at the end of the day the real true measure about the success or the value of a, a geo profile is does it help the police do their job that's if it doesn't help them, then there's not much point. It's just a piece of paper. 
But if it does help them, and sometimes it'll help them in ways you don't even think about. Um, and, and that's why you need that interaction. Can I just do a quick recap of what you've said so far? So your definition of geographic profiling in a nutshell is you're using the um, temporal information and the geographical information of crime locations to um, to look at the probabilities of where you might find the offender or where you where you should start. So it's like a prioritization tool. And when you do the course to qualify people in geographic profiling that, that you and others provide, the, the first week is actually the background research, the theory of just the understanding that the person should have and then the second week is using the software and, and actually using some hands-on tools to um, to run through some examples. Well, um, I think the first week, while it does cover that theory, is also designed to be practical. Um, and we will use examples that show people how an understanding of geography is useful even if you don't have software. And in fact, if you have a single crime, you're not going to be using Rigel because it, it requires a series of crimes. Um, but there could be valuable insights that can be gained just by thinking about where did this occur? Where did that occur? What are the different site types associated with the crime? For example, with a murder, you can have an encounter site between the offender and the victim, an attack site, the actual murder scene, and then where the body gets disposed of. Each of those locations serves a different purpose for the offender and therefore provides different sort of clues or perspectives for the detective. One other thing that you said that I um, is correct, but I, I missed is that in addition to the geographic locations, there's a lot of value in understanding the temporal aspects of the crime. When it happened, the timing between crimes, the day of the week, um, day of the week, time of the day, the season, the weather, um, those all provide useful um, uh, insights, particularly when you have a series of crimes, because you can start to see patterns there. And, you know, you, you know that any given particular street is going to be very different at four o'clock in the afternoon than it would be at four o'clock at night. So one of the things I would try to do if I was visiting crime sites is to go to the location at the time that the crime occurred, because then you get some sense of who's out and about, what's, what's occurring, um, what might the offender be seeing at that time. For example, the city of London, which is not the, the center or the West End, it's a specific area in the city where there's a lot of people working in professional, high, uh, well, sometimes well-paid, but white collar jobs. If you go there anytime during the week, it's it's got thousands of people in it. If you go there on a Saturday or Sunday, it's empty, it's deserted. Nobody's working there, nobody's working in these offices, and it's, it is a completely different area. And then you need to look at who would be there at that time and why you know why why is that on exactly. their mental map um, to speak can I, can I give you a case example of, of the importance of that so I've been asked to prepare a geographic profile on a serial rapist Rittenhouse Square rapist in Philadelphia Pennsylvania in the US and what this offender was doing was he was breaking into these um, buildings about three or four in the morning and attacking women um, these buildings were fairly close to the University of Pennsylvania, so you had a lot of older buildings that were once, you know, very large, but had been turned into sort of rooming houses. So you might have half a dozen or more sort of separate apartments on different floors in what used to be these very large grand homes. So um, there'd been a, a murder um, with one of the rapes and the police were very interested in catching the offender. Um, and they were putting a lot of surveillance efforts into trying to apprehend the offender or trying to find the offender around the time that the crimes were occurring. So, you know, maybe they would start around, you know, midnight and they would be doing all this surveillance. But any experienced police officer knows trying to catch somebody breaking in is really difficult. And walking around the area, it became clear that this is not what the offender was doing because there was no way in the world he would know what he was breaking into at that time. Everything's dark, there's no one on the street, um, it was quiet, and if you, when, when you're on the outside of one of these buildings, you couldn't figure out what was on the inside. So how did he know 
what places contain female students and what contain male students. Because there have been no reports of him going into the wrong place. So it seemed very clear that what he was doing was prowling around much earlier, particularly when people are coming home from work. Um, and the prime time would be after it's dark. So, and, and I saw this myself. You see a woman walking down the street. She goes into a building. And then even though there's three floors or four floors, you wait to see where the lights go on. Now you know where she is. And um, so the, it would have been much better to back the surveillance up to look for somebody doing, you know, following women or acting suspiciously earlier on. Now, you're not going to catch them in the act. But if you know, if you start collecting names, you've got DNA from the rapes it would be a very short step there. So the whole idea of, of understanding when the offender was hunting, distinct or separate from when he was committing the crime, was important and valuable. You can think of a crime like an iceberg. So you, you've got that part, the actual you know, um, event itself, but that's only 10% where there's a lot of stuff in many cases, not every case, but many cases where the offender is planning and hunting and that's a point of vulnerability for the offender that the police can exploit. So you're you're looking at at his preparation, at his thinking process, at his decision making, and and really the the actual crime is just the tip of the iceberg. And it's especially with work well, with break-ins, it is just too too difficult to catch someone in the act because it is just a few minutes. But if you then try to expand your search to something that could take longer, that he might be doing for hours, he might be doing repeatedly over a few days, you've got a better chance of actually catching him. And you just, it was just figured out that actually there's more to it than him just going in and committing this pinpoint a time and moments to his crime and coming out. So, so that's where you took the opportunity. Like he's actually here much more than we know and this is where we've got a better chance of seeing someone right you want to you have a, a, a much larger window when he's hunting and you don't have you're not going to catch him in the act if he's hunting unless he does something silly or stupid but if you can identify him and then you've got dna you can follow up and determine hey is this somebody that we need to um, try to obtain a dna sample to either eliminate or you know to put him in the picture that's really fascinating. Okay. Um, how did you first become interested in geographic profiling and why? So when I first started graduate work, I encountered um, professors Paul and Patricia Branningham at Simon Fraser's School of Criminology. And the Branninghams are what are called environmental criminologists. Environmental criminologists are not really interested in the question of why someone committed a crime. They're much more interested in the where and when they commit the crime. So they look for patterns. And because I was working in policing, I saw tremendous value in this idea of patterns. Um, you know, I have a sister who's a school teacher, and I used to say to her that she could do more to prevent crime than I could. Because at the time I see somebody as a police officer, it's, it's pretty late in the game. But as a police officer, if I know where and when to go, on patrol or on a stakeout or surveillance you know i have control over that and so this whole notion that there are these patterns to crime that even so-called random crimes are not random not at least in terms of how the offender hunts or where the crimes occur or when they crime crimes occur i found that fascinating so that was step one the um, for my master's thesis i did a study of uh criminal fugitives and their movements across the country, which kind of got me into the whole geography of crime and a lot of quantitative geography techniques. But that was kind of a, what we call a macro level thing. Then I became aware of what the FBI were doing, studying serial murder and serial rape. And um, I can remember looking at, a, I think it was the FBI law enforcement bulletin and they were talking about their violent crime apprehension uh, program and they were tracking serial killers. And they actually had a map of this one killers crimes and I'm looking at each one of the dots of the map and I'm thinking that's a pattern and maybe we can analyze that pattern and use that to help an investigation on a micro level in other words for one offender so that was really the the start of it so you were already a police officer but you were studying on the side and just found the Brantingham's work and then found found more work from by other people and you just saw 
saw the connection and then dug deeper into it? Yes, I, I, I had my bachelor's degree when I joined the job. I had a background in mathematics. So this idea of anything that you could put on a map to me was very interesting. I um, did my master's and then my, my doctorate while I was working, but I always wanted to do research that would be useful, that wouldn't just sit on a library shelf. Um, and so that to me framed the types of questions that I wanted to look at, as opposed to, you know, many other criminologists who are, might be more interested in theory or, or methods. I was interested in, in something that could actually be used. And, and so that's sort of what drove me. That's, uh, I completely identify with that because that's why I'm doing this um, Dr. IPIP YouTube channel because I'm so frustrated with all this great academic research by academics for academics and the police practitioner never gets to hear any of it. They don't, they can't access the journals. You have to pay for them. You have to subscribe to them. The police force is not giving you that subscription and they're just not, used to and don't have the time to go through all this research. That's why I just wanted to pull some things out and say to them, hey, this is something that you should know. This is for you. This is something you can use. Go ahead and try it. And so that's, I, I really identify with that point you made. Um, so speaking of mathematics, which by the way is, is the opposite of a strength in me. So well, kudos to you. Tell us about how you came up with your formula for geographic profiling as you were whizzing past Mount Fuji in Japan. In Canada and the United States, unlike the UK, you begin your doctorate program by taking a number of courses, writing comprehensive exams and doing other stuff. So while I knew what I wanted to do, I wasn't really working on my, my doctoral research at this point. I happened to be in Japan on an unrelated project looking at community-based policing um, in Japan with their Koban um, system. And I was on the bullet train going south from Tokyo to Nagoya. Um, and I'm looking out the window um, about the point we're going by Mount Fuji. And the idea of how to mathematically approach this just kind of popped into my head. Um, and because it was on you know, a, a train with Japan that is called Japan Railways, they had these little napkins called JR napkins. So I'm writing everything down on these napkins. And um, then I very carefully took th these ideas home with me. However, the approach was one that required an algorithm and, and a computer. And I had a little familiarity with computers, but I really didn't know how to program. So to really put this idea into action, I had to learn how to do a lot of programming. So I had a friend that was in the computer industry um, and he taught me um, some of the basics and it took me about nine months to write the computer program. Um, it was just done a quick basic, simple, but uh, uh, maybe about 500 lines of code. And I tried it on a case that I had a solved information for, a serial arson case. And it worked very well. So that seemed to be promising. And um, it sort of became the, the focal point of the, the doctoral research was applying this algorithm to um, solve cases to see how well it would perform. And um, originally, the title of my dissertation was going to be Target Patterns of Serial Murderers. But one of my faculty advisors says, no, this has really become about geographic profiling, which is the phrase I, I use to kind of um, characterize this this probability assessment. Um, and so we, we changed the title to geographic profiling, colon, target patterns of serial murders. But I'm a big believer in the the power of the subconscious. And you, you put a lot of stuff in there and you read everything you can and you mull it over and think about it. And you give your, your brain a chance to kind of explore some things and and sometimes that that works and, and uh, idea will percolate to the surface and, and sometimes it doesn't i agree i've had that where sometimes I've, I've got a task and i feel that okay at the moment i have no idea how to go about it i'm just going to park it in my brain for a while carry on with other things and i might get back to it in a few hours few days few weeks even and actually i, I just i just start writing something down something has materialized passively 
in the meantime in my brain, which is a really nice passive way of letting your brain do all the work. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> um, have you had a, a geographic profiling moment in your career that really stands out, like that was your golden hour, a moment that you will never forget with regards to geographic profiling? I guess there's been a few. Um... One particularly satisfying one um, was working on a case in Lafayette, Louisiana, um, and the detective on the case, the name was um, uh, Mac um, Galleon, um, and Mac had been trying to find the serial rapist for, for many years, and we went down there to work with him and, and left him with a profile, and he... Um, uh, you know, Mac was a very good detective, so a suspect came to his attention, but where the suspect lived wasn't particularly, you know, high up on the profile. But then Mac says, he, he went the extra step. He says, well, the profile is based on where the guy was living when the rapes were occurring, not where he's living today. So he did the extra step, and so many good detectives just do this little one extra step. So in Mac's case, it was finding out where this guy lived when the rapes were going on, which had been a few years ago now. And he lived in the almost like dead center of the case. Um, and as a consequence, they um, the, the man was a smoker, so they made the effort to get some of his discarded cigarette butts, which they sent to the lab. Result came back positive. They arrested him. He actually was a sergeant in the sheriff's department. Um, and he knew all about the case and was monitoring it and everything. So that was a very, um, and then Mac let me know about it uh, when it happened. So it was very uh, positive and rewarding moment being able to help Mac um, go out and, and catch this guy. And I, maybe that's, this is a good time, um, Susan, to make the point that sometimes people will say, well, how many crimes you solve with geographic profiling? And my answer to that is really simple, none. First of all, you only solve a crime with physical evidence, a witness, or a confession. And the role of the profile is help a detective get to one of those through maybe hundreds or thousands of suspects and all, all the rest of the information that can accumulate in a, a major crime case. And then two, it's the detective or the detectives um, that solve the case. And you're just you know playing a, a little side role to try to help them. But to the degree that you, you can help somebody, that's very, very positive. Okay, and have you had that? That was that was an amazing example with that. Um, with it, was it the detective? Did you say in the sheriff's department? It was a sergeant in the sheriff's department. Sergeant who was the rapist, yeah. Who was actually monitoring the investigation? So that that was that was such a good, such a good outcome then to identify that person. Have you, on the flip side, have you had a worst GP moment or your darkest GP moment, a geographic profiling moment in your career? Well, what is I think you find very frustrating is you find out that you did a really accurate profile, but they never used it. Um, so in, in one case involving one of the RCMP psychological profilers, he happened to be in this location where a serial murderer of men, um, of gay men had been operating and they had caught the person. He just happened to be there for something incidental and he said, I'm familiar with this case. Um, I think like that guy lived right across the street from the peak part of the profile, the geo profile. And the detective said, what geographic profile? Um, so somebody had been promoted, somebody moved in, they didn't know anything about it. So that's like, you just feel really frustrated sometimes that it could have been useful, but it ended up just being ignored or overlooked or, and that happens. Communication, feedback, that's yep. often in not big, working well. Big cases, it's more likely to happen in these big serial crime cases because there's so many people, there's so many, uh, they go on for so long, it, it, it just can be a real nightmare keeping track of things. Now you've actually um, used geographic profiling in more areas than crime, haven't you? What, what other areas have you found it to be useful in? Well, one of the first places that um, it began to be explored outside of policing was the, the military, um, interested in 
analyzing IED attacks, improvised explosive devices attacks. And, and when the um, invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq occurred, some of these, uh, the military personnel had been reserves and they worked for the police department. So they knew about geographic profiling. Um, so we did some work with them. And then also we did some work with biologists and zoologists uh, because uh, the idea came out, look, at we've got multiple attack locations of great white sharks in Fault Space, South Africa. Um, what can we use to see what that will tell us about how sharks hunt? Or um, we established a long-term relationship with Steve Lacomer um, at Queen Mary University in London. And uh, Steve is a biologist and um, with him and some of his students, um, the technique and the methodology has been applied to uh, uh, bat foraging in Scotland and um, bee uh, movements when they're, they're gaining um, or collecting uh, uh, pollen um, to the sources of invasive species. Um, we, we did a couple of really interesting projects together that weren't really about biology though. Um, we collected data on um, uh, a case in Berlin from the Second World War. Um, a couple called the Hampels had turned against the, the Nazi government and had started to write these little postcards, you know, just like a postcard you might send somebody, but they would say things like, don't trust Hitler, don't trust Goebbels, and they would leave them around apartment buildings. So the Berlin police and the Gestapo got involved and um, they were very efficient and effective because they recorded the exact location and the dates and everything about where they were finding these. There was um, a, like a couple hundred cards, uh, postcards recovered. So we had someone translate all the Gestapo records and then we flew to Berlin and visit the locations and we ran the analysis because the at the time, the German police were trying to apply the basic concepts of geographic profile, uh, but they didn't have any computers. Um, and their their approach was was a, a good one. It, it uh, if they had modern technology, it, it could have worked because we had a really narrow focus on the apartment building that the Hamples lived in. Um, and and so that was a very interesting project, a little bit of a history project, and um, of course geographic profiling and another one we did was analyze one of Steve's students used the methods to analyze the locations where Banksy um, the artist had left um, some of his street paintings and we saw if that we wanted to see if that would fit the only real suspect that's been identified um, uh, or has been suggested was um, a guy called um, Robin Gunningham Cunningham, yes. Okay, and it, he fit very well with the profile. You know, we we can't say that he is Banksy because of that, but uh, he certainly was a good fit geographically. It was interesting seeing the reaction though, because a lot of people were interested. Some people were very upset that we had outed um, Banksy, and we go, well, you know, he he was in the newspapers well before we came along, so we didn't do anything. We just did a little analysis on it and then particularly very funny uh somebody from the bloomberg news service which is a financial news service interviewed me and they says you realize we've estimated that you have appreciably added the, to the value of uh, uh banksy's works now because of all the publicity about this <laughs> so he made a little bit of money from our our approach but i mean um what is interesting is you can apply it to these different things um we used it to look at um malaria um sorry reports of um malaria in uh cairo egypt and then use that to prioritize the the water breeding grounds for the types of mosquitoes that carry um malaria um we did an old analysis on Dr. John Snow's data from Soho, London, um, on the cholera outbreak. And um, this is something S Snow figured out on his own, but we just wanted to see how the profile would work in terms of prioritizing the water pumps for the infected water source. Um, at, at the time Dr. Snow was doing this, the general belief was that 
cholera was spread through um, miasma or bad air. And his analysis suggested it might be something to do with the water source. Funny enough, one of his key clues was the fact that the men who worked in the local brewery didn't have cholera because they were drinking the beer. <laughs> Right, okay, so they, they never touched a drop of water, they were just helping themselves to um, to the beer that they were making. And that just goes to show the importance of <laughs> of the pub. <laughs> so I, I remember Dr. Snow did some very detailed analysis. He actually tried to trace back everything, where people had gotten their drinking water from that day, and even if it had been before, where, where was the actual origin? So for him to identify back then exactly which water pump was actually spreading this disease that that was that was an amazing piece of work. I, I do cite that in, in in my own research as well. That that is really fascinating. Um, you you have also collaborated on another case with Steve Lacoma, though that is quite relevant to to London. Did you not do some work around Jack the Ripper? Oh, I I did that bef well before I met Steve. Um, right. uh, it's actually in my two thousand book. Um, those. Steve and I did a presentation together at the Cheltenham Time Science Festival, and and so that you, that's might be where you've seen that. But um, but that was something I did back when I was still in Vancouver, and it was, you know, I'd, I'd always been interested in Jack the Ripper, and I'd done walking tours and um, read various books on it, and so I thought I would just see how it worked out. But what was interesting was that. The focus of the geo profile was in an area of Whitechapel called Flower and Dean Street, which was known at the time as the Wicked Quarter Mile. And there was a lot of supporting evidence about, um, so the, the last victim was seen at the end of that street, um, walking uh, towards where she lived with uh, a gentleman she picked up, who's often thought to have been the Ripper. Um, many of the people, the victims lived within a short time period of that street. Um, the piece of bloody apron found after the fourth attack was sort of found halfway between Mitre Square where the attack occurred and Flower and Dean Street um, and the model Wentworth buildings. And then uh, there was some documentation that the police at the time thought the um, Flower and Dean Street should have been quote unquote the epicenter of their search. So we'll, we'll never know. Um, but it was a lot of fun doing it, and unfortunately there's not much to see of that area today because it was bombed in the Second World War, and um, much of eastern, much of East London has changed, so you, you can't actually walk through the particular area that's where, he, where the Jack the Ripper may have lived, but um, um, you can still see enough of it to make it uh, an interesting trip. That, that, that's actually a good example for the fact that it is not just crime sites that form your data points in a geographical analysis, is it? It's also, you talked about uh, an apron or part of an apron being found, it's property deposition sites, it's where a victim and the offender might have encountered each other, it's where the, vic uh, the victim might be deposited or really as, a, as a dead body or where they might be released by the offender it's where the offender may have taken something from the victim and then just dropped it and dumped it on the way somewhere else so there's so many different kinds of locations that can come into an analysis and nowadays even where their their mobile phone might have pinged off a mast that's another location isn't it where they might have used um, a cash machine where they or i think you call it atm in in america or where they might have been seen on cctv so it's not only crime locations and crime sites that that can form part of the analysis. It's a lot of other geographical and temporal information, isn't it? That's right. If we can place the offender at a location physically, um, then we may be able to use that point. We've done it with telephone booths that the offender have, has used. We've done it in kidnapping cases where um, the offender is using a cell phone and we know the closest tower. One of the, the big cases that I worked on in, in England, um, a project called Operation Lynx, the offender stole a bank card and, and then, um, or a credit card, and he used it to make a bunch of purchases. So at least we assumed it was the offender. We didn't know for sure at the time, but there was only a handful of rapes to analyze, but there was m many purchase points. 
and that served as the, the, the major input for the analysis, which helped focus on where the offender lived. And in and, and that case made a real significant difference um, in terms of what the police were doing, which was um, a hand search of fingerprint files, which is incredibly time consuming. So the more you can help narrow that focus, the, the more important, you know, any sort of profiling it can be. And you, you did mention early on um, an analyzing single crimes as well. You said you can't use your Rigel software if you only have one crime location. But how, what do you see the potential of geographic profiling when you only have a single crime rather than a series? Well, first of all, the more locations you have, the, the, the greater the focus. It's the analogy I like to use is you don't know what's going to happen with a given spin of a, a roulette wheel. but you can count on the fact that at the end of the day it's the house that's going to be taken home all the money so that's the way probability works so you're it becomes less certain more chancy but sometimes even like with a single crime um, you might have information about the offender's movements or you might know where the encounter occurred where the body was dumped um, where the victim's bicycle was dropped off and and that can provide you with some information um, that is of value. In one case I can think of from um, Canada, the um, analysis of the location suggested the offender didn't have access to transportation. And that was very important because there was a suspicious sighting of a van driving around the neighborhood and the police were pursuing this idea of the van, but the geography says if this person had a van, then we would see very, very um, different distances involved in the crime and, and a different set of um, geographic location. So there's um, often at least something that can be developed from from even um, a little bit of geography, and, but it all depends on the specifics of the case too. Mm -hmm. And how, how would you say in all the time that you've worked with geographic profiling, it has changed or evolved and where do you think it will go in the future? Well, originally when I was doing this research, I thought it had application to serial murder. And by the time I finished my PhD, I'd, I'd worked on cases involving um, robbery and, and sex crimes and rape. Um, my external advisor during my defense told me to change some wording because he said, there's no reason in the world for you to say that this cannot be also used on property crime. Um, and he was right. So I think the biggest thing is that we see an expansion to different types of crimes and different sort of angles and, and wrinkles of how it can be used. Um, in terms of the basic algorithm, um, I think there's only been one change that was ever that was made and that was the very early days. Um, the software's got a lot more sophisticated. The original version I wrote, Quick Basic, with 500 lines of code. The current version is about a million lines of code, and you know it's much more powerful in all different Slight ways. Change. Slight upgrade. Yes. <laughs> and, of, and of course, another thing is back in that day, very few people used GIS systems, and now most police departments have geographic information systems, and most people have access to Google um, Maps and Google Earth and um, Apple Maps, so all that stuff is is so much more prevalent and useful. Um, one of the advantages of geographic profiling over behavioral profiling or psychological profiling is that so much of the data that we have in society, so much of the data the, the police agencies have, has a location attached to it. So that's a handle that we can grab and use to manipulate that data. Uh, you can give me a list of 10,000 addresses for suspects and I can click a button and Rigel will just prioritize them in a, in a second. Um, and ha having access to that type of information is very powerful. I, I mentioned to you earlier about the Rittenhouse Square Rapist where the timing was very important in terms of what was going on um, and trying to catch the offender and the police surveillance would have been much better backing up by several hours. Well, I think it's interesting how that person got caught because it relates to what we were talking about. The person left Philadelphia, the rapist left Philadelphia. I mentioned that he had murdered somebody and there was a lot of media attention, a lot of police um, um, efforts, and so he left. And after some months, 
the uh, National DNA Data Bank run by the FBI in the United States, CODIS, got a hit that a serial rapist in Fort Collins, Colorado, had the same DNA um, at, left at the crime scenes as the Rittenhouse Square rapist did. So now they know he's moved to Fort Collins. And the Fort Collins police asked me to go there to do a profile. But before, I think the day before I got on the airplane, um, they caught the person. And what they did was they used these sort of, um, these commercial databases that are often used for determining what type of junk mail you're going to be sent. Um, Because you get profiled by your age and gender and your income as to whether this company or that company is going to... uh, find you a likely customer. Well, what they did was they said, all right, during this time period in Philadelphia, when the rapes were occurring, what people were on these various databases, it could be a magazine subscription, it could be your telephone bill, it could be your power company account. And then how many of those names show up in Fort Collins at that time period when, um, at that time period when those rapes are happening? And that produced eight, 900 names. Now, it might seem a lot, but not so bad for a, a you know, serial rape case in a murder case. However, think about this for a second. We have, let's say, I'll simplify, 800 names. Well, only half of them are going in one direction, and that's the, dire- the only direction we care about. Uh, we don't care about the people coming from Fort Collins to Philadelphia. We're the ones that are just going in. So now we're down to 400. Half of those, approximately, will be female. Now we're down to 200. Then you narrow it down by um, race. The offender was black. You narrow it down by his age span. Um, he wasn't particularly old. And I think they ended up with something like 12 people that were left. And uh, Troy Graves was one of the first ones they called in for an interview just to talk to him. And he was acting all weird and suspicious. And they didn't even finish the interview when they said, we got to get this guy's DNA. And it was him. So, is, you know, th- that case was solved by the fact that they could tap into these commercial geographic databases. Um, and, and, you know, we, we leave our mark in so many different ways, like you mentioned using a cell phone um, or if we get a traffic ticket somewhere or a parking ticket. You know, we're, we're leaving our, our geographic footprints behind. And for criminals, that can be a problem for them. And, and I think that is happening more and more, isn't it? We are we are leaving more and more data points. We're not at the minority report stage yet where we're being recognized when we just walk past a poster somewhere in the street. Um, but I think we will have more and more data points just as we move, around, move about in space because we have a mobile phone with us, for example, so that can be tracked retrospectively. Um, so you've, you've kind of covered a lot of information um, so far, and this channel is aimed at practitioners. So if, because people can only retain a certain amount of information, if they were only going to take away one or two key points from this interview, what would you want those key points to be? Well, the geography is a clue, and they should be aware of it and try to collect all the geographic information they can on a crime. One of the things that we discovered was maybe a weak point with geographic profiling was a, a failure of police agencies to do a linkage analysis, determine what other crimes might be linked to the crime you're investigating. So if you have a, a rapist is this, and it's a stranger, well, what other rapes might have occurred? But what other burglaries or, or prowlings could be the same offender? Um, and the more information we get on the offender, the more pieces to the puzzle that you have. In the United Kingdom, there's trained, fully trained geographic profilers for all types of crimes, um, very, very capable individuals based at the National Crime Agency. Um, And there's also people trained um, in, uh, for property crime and in other, um, of of various other police agencies in the UK and in a number of countries in Europe. And they're just a resource to be um, contacted to see, you know, what might be done in terms of a geographic profile or some sort of supporting analysis. So at the moment, um, when I did my master's uh, dissertation on geographic profiling, we had um, four geographic profilers at what is now the National Crime Agency. Now we have one, um, you know, cutbacks and everything. 
And so obviously he's, he's quite busy, I imagine, um, covering the whole country by himself. So in all the cases where police officers can't contact um, Richard Me and the geographic profiler, how do you suggest, what, what is the best they can do for themselves if they just don't have that national support? Depends on the type of crime. If they're dealing with a serial murder or serial rape case, they, they probably need to get to him for help um, and let him know what the urgency is. Um, I don't think there's ever been an instance of, of one geographic one geographic profile asking for help from somebody else. That's always a possibility. But if it's something else, like a robbery or a burglary, there's a number of uh, people trained in geographic profiling with other um, UK police agencies. Um, uh, for example, Christian Lights with the Met um, is very capable. So those people could help out for anything up to the serial murder, serial, serial rape cases. And even in those cases, and I do this sometimes, I'll ask them to do the groundwork and then send me a, a Rigel file and then I'll check it over and, and take it from there. Um, I'm not sure what the protocols are because there are a number of protocols with, with UK policing, but I, I, I don't think there's too many times someone needed a profile in an important case and they weren't able to get help in a timely fashion. And just finally, if if people want to find out more about um, either geographic profiling or yourself, where where would you send them? Where should they go to find out more? Fine. I mean, the I don't want to sound like I'm plugging my book, but the geographic profiling book probably has the most information. Though there are a number of shorter book chapters and articles. I quite often get somebody from somewhere in the world, police officer, or student, or academic, um, wanting a copy of a of an article or paper and um, I can send it to them. Um, there's a little bit of information on our um, center's website, um, www.txstate/gii for our, our center. Um, and I also think there's some information on the ECRI Canada website. They're the people that produce the Rigel software. Um, but yeah, Google's a powerful search tool and um, you know, a lot of stuff can just come up from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll link to those um, in, in the text underneath. So thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed for staying awake until, what time is it now, 1.30 in the morning for you? Yeah. And are you going to get some sleep now? Uh, maybe in a little bit. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And um, this, this has been so, so useful and, and I'm, I'm sure people will really get some value of it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this content useful. You can get access to each episode's transcript with key learning points, timestamps and references if you get yourself onto my mailing list. Just go to the main website on policesciencedoctor.com and on the bottom of each page you will find a sign-up form for notifications of new content. Just enter your first name your preferred email address and the type of organization you work for. You will not get any spam, this is just for me to let you know about new content and for you to get access to all the transcripts.